Virgo too, a large white cross upraised. The cross in this image is a Christian cross. So we're examining that process whereby a population puts a lot of time and effort into glorifying the image that represents their highest beliefs, in this case Christ. But we can go back over the years and consider Stonehenge and perhaps the pyramids and, and other features all around the world throughout history of the same process of, of raising up, giving something a higher importance than other things. And this idea, intuitively, something that's higher than something else is more important. And you can see this in any modern culture. Look for the highest buildings to see who's in charge. There was a time when the, the cathedrals were the highest, when the Christians were in charge in the West. Now it's the skyscrapers when the corporate sector is in charge. In the Soviet system, you'd have the, the railway stations bigger than all the other houses around it, and, and um, the, the railway station was the, the processes of government and so on. So this, this idea of raising things up to glorify it is well celebrated in, in history and in our psychology. Now, we may not be Christians. We may not even enjoy the imagery of a crucifixion. Uh, and yet, what we were being asked to do in this symbol is put those details aside and, and look at the act of raising up itself. Whatever it is we raise up, and it could be a football team for some people, that we make sacred. We're talking about sacredness here. And many of us were brought up with religious teachings, and they were presented to us as a fait accompli, a, this is the truth. No attempt to persuade or explain or really answer questions of the ambiguities within the teachings. And those of us who had a certain sensitivity and intelligence were inclined to reject all of it because of most of it. Most of what we're taught, certainly in Christianity, is absolute nonsense, but some of it is not. I venture to suggest this is true of other religions as well. And it's so, so easy to chuck the baby out with the bathwater and reject God, because the spokespersons for this energy, whatever it is, um, have, have not spoken very, very well. They've been inauthentic or confused or bullying or whatever you associate with your religious leaders. But they haven't actually been God itself. <laughs> They've been poor messengers. And, and it's really silly for us to just throw out the message because the messenger wasn't very good. And all of us have been subject to these processes whereby the messengers of this message have done very badly indeed. I, I can't think of anyone who's done more harm for the Christian church than the priesthood. How do we do that, though? How do we make sure we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater? And there's no easy answer. It's not an easy process to distinguish between all the pressure, the, the, the oratory and the bullying and the persuasive forces of people that try to persuade us that this is true and that is not, is coming at us all the time, not only pre priests, also politicians and marketing executives and parents and friends. We're being bludgeoned by persuasive arguments that are specious, they're just false. It's the nature of reality that the the poor mind is, is inundated with, with nonsense. And it's, it's an extraordinarily exceptional person that can actually stay with the game and, and try and pick out the truth from the false and, and just understand what's going on. We will never really be told by another what's going on. It, it can't happen. We have to work it out for ourselves. And the confidence in order to be able to do that is hard won. 
We have to reject what feels wrong. That's the first stage, I think. We can't think it through because the mind is already dominated by propaganda before it can think properly. Before we go to school at the age of five or whatever, we're already indoctrinated. We've already been um, shaped by lies. And so when we go to school, it gets shaped even further in that direction. We, we lose the capacity for intelligent thought unless we trust our feelings. Now, you can bully the mind really quite easily, but the essential deepest level of intuition is, is not subject to that process in quite the same way. It can be hidden, but we can actually recover it. We can access that feeling of whether it's instinct or intuition, it's not really matter, it doesn't matter, but there's a feeling inside that makes us know, look, oh, this isn't quite right, something's wrong here, that person has said something, it, it doesn't check out, it doesn't check out about the other things that I've heard, it doesn't check out against the body language, it doesn't check out about against what actually feels right. That's our saving grace, and the more we trust, our ability to know what's not right, the better. The more then we can start to look for what might be right. And that could well be said to be the beginning of the seeker's journey, when they've said to themselves, look, enough of this, enough of this lying nonsense and bullying propaganda. I need to find out for myself what's going on. And then the journey begins. How do you tell what's real from then on? Big test. I think it's important to have an emotional relationship with your beliefs. We need to love them and we need to treat them lovingly, gently, carefully. We don't put them into a fight that they can't win. You know, we protect our beliefs as though they're children until they're ready to take on other beliefs and then we have to become straightforward and warrior-like in a sense just refusing to go along with what isn't in keeping with what we believe and to stand on principle no that's wrong I'm not agreeing with that I'm standing against that I think all of us come to that level in life where on some level we become almost crucified by standing for our beliefs. Because that's what the cross image does represent, that there was a man who was willing to die for his beliefs. And even though we may not have to actually die and actually be subject to torture, nevertheless, we will probably be examined and made to suffer some price, some consequences of holding strong to our belief. It's a big and important test in life. Those people that just give in, capitulate, and do what's expedient, they go their way, they become a part of the sheep. But those of us that say, no, that's, that's not okay for me, we're, we're the goats, we're, we're, we're walking our own mountain path. And what, again, is in the imagery here is, is, is the walking up the mountain image. We're raising ourselves up as much as we're raising a symbol of our sacredness, we're raising ourselves to meet that symbol. We have to glorify ourselves if we are to glorify God. And that process is to make sacred what we are, what we think, what we feel, what we do, to make that sacred. That's how we glorify ourselves. And it's right to do that, despite all the teachings that we should not, the, the teachings, the false teachings, that humility is the only way to God. It's, it's not true. It's, it's, it's even wrong, I think, to practice false humility. It's, it distorts it. It means that you can't access true humility. When you're in the presence of your sacredness, the highest aspect of your sacredness, humility bubbles up within you. That's how you know you're in the right place, because you don't get arrogant about your sacredness. You surrender to it, and that surrendering is humility. That's how we glorify God, by glorifying 
sacredness within us and surrendering to it. That's what raises us up. 